Okay. Let's start recording. So, uh, let me start the uh, OCT Paper Club uh, number. It's a uh, twelve, I guess. And uh, finally, uh, this is. Uh, hold on. Somebody is coming. Admit Arata here. Okay. And so, uh, finally, uh, this is my turn to present. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about the very basic of OCT. Uh, right? And uh, so, it's a very basic, but uh, uh, here, through this presentation, I would like to clarify some hidden hot topic of uh, recent OCT activity. Right? Okay, somebody. Is it? Uh, is it Shantie? It seems Shantie is coming. Okay, uh, in, anyway, uh, through this talk today, I'm going to clarify some hidden hot topic of the OCD. But a presentation itself looks like a, something like a summary of a very basic of OCDs. Okay, uh, let me share my screen and let me start my presentation. Hold on. Your screen. Okay, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, let me start my presentation. And uh, this talk was only, uh, originally, um, say, structured for a kind of imaging symposium in uh, Optics Photonics Japan meeting. And that was a symposium to talk about uh, the imaging theories and the imaging property of uh, several types of microscopy. And in this symposium, we treated the OCD as a one of the microscopic modality. So uh, the audiences and expected audiences of that the symposium is not the OCT specialist, but uh, uh, microscopy. Actually, it's not specialists, but uh, users, right? So I here first I uh, summarize in this talk, the image property of the OCD and the qualify the limitation of the current OCD theory. So let me start. The title of my talk is Image Formation of Optical Coherence Tomography, OCT. And here in this talk, I would like to start from a very, very brief history of OCD and uh, the classification of subtypes of OCD. And then going to go to the, uh, hold on. Whoa. Then I'm going to uh, go on the basic OCD imaging property and then explain how to improve the imaging performance. Uh, hold on, give me time. Okay. And then uh, as an extension of OCD, not only the improving the basic property of the OCD, uh, OCD resolution of, or, and the signal to noise ratio, I'm also going to talk about the extension of OCD contrast. And then I'm going to talk about uh, why we need to revisit the OCD imaging theory. As a, a brief history of the OCD here, it's uh, only one slide, uh, but the, the, maybe some of you, or almost all of you, knows about the epoch of OCD. It was in 1991 in MIT. And uh, Professor James Fujimoto and uh, David Huan are main guys to develop the OCD. And here is a very early OCD image taken from the first paper, Science 1991, and it is uh, exovivo porcine retina. And uh, still maybe on around 1998 or 2000, OCD directly, uh, directly meant the time domain OCD. Here is the first subtype and the original subtype of OCD. And it is a point detection system. And to obtain the two-dimensional cross-sectional image, you need to scan the sample mechanically two-dimensionally. So it results in a long measurement time, and uh, it results in relatively low sensitivity. Um, but in any way, the time domain OCD itself was successful for the retina imaging. But as the time domain OCD became successful in a clinic, there was uh, another wave of the OCD, uh, OCD development that was Fourier domain OCD. It was around 1995 to 1998. Now, Fourier domain OCD is, uh, uh, in, con in contrast to the time domain OCD, Fourier domain OCD, FD OCD, is a line detection system. So 
by a single shot, you can measure the two dimensional image. Uh, sorry, uh, by a single shot, you can take a one dimensional uh, depth resolved data. And by using a one dimensional mechanical scan, by using Garbo scan, you can take a two dimensional image. So uh, this modality is associated with a high optical efficiency. So the signal to noise ratio of FD OCD was uh, 20 dB better than time domain OCD. And it also results in a high speed measurement. And this high speed measurement can be used for three dimensional in vivo tomography. And this Fourier domain OCD also can be classified into two subtypes. The one is spectral domain OCD, which is a combination of the broad mount light source and a high speed spectrometer. And that is particularly useful for the probe wave length shorter than one micron because, um, say, it is easy to build a good high-speed spectrometer with silicon camera uh, for this spectral domain OCD. And the silicon only has the sensitivity uh, to the wavelength shorter than one micron. So what you should do uh, if you're interested in to use a longer wavelength probe, and for this, there is another subtype of OCD, FD OCD, that is so-called a swept source OCD. It, is a combination of the wavelength sweeping light source and the point detection. Um, but in any way, the spectral domain OCD and the swept source OCD, uh, both of them are based on the same mathematics. It's a free transform. So uh, let me show that the uh, basic imaging principles and the properties of OCDs, including the time domain OCD and the free domain OCD. So to think about the structure resolving principle of OCDs, we need to first separate the axial issues and the lateral issues because OCD uses a totally different principle to resolve the axial information and the lateral information. Sorry. Uh, for the axial resolution, OCD uses a low coherence interferometry. And uh, this low coherence interferometry can be subdivided into two subcategories, as I've already explained. It's a one is a time domain OCD, and the other is a spectral domain OCD, or spectral interferometry. For the lateral resolution, OCD uses actually two types of resolution principle. And the most major one is a point scanning. It is somehow similar to reflection confocal. And the other is a full field imaging. It is somehow equivalent to a spatial, uh, sorry, this, uh, sorry, sorry. And the, uh, the second lateral resolving principle is full field imaging. And it is further subdivided into two. One is a spatially incoherent imaging, and the other is spatially coherent imaging. And these two, again, has a slightly different imaging property or resolution property, lateral resolution property. In addition, uh, there is something in between to the point scanning and the full field, it is line field imaging. And this line field imaging has uh, somehow uh, the resolution property some, somehow in between the point scanning and the full field imaging. Okay, uh, let me summarize on um, which kind of, say, on um, uh, let me summarize which kind of model, which modality is suitable for which kind of applications. The combination of the point scanning and the time domain and the Fourier domain OCD are the most standard configuration. In the early time of OCD, the time domain point scanning combination was uh, very standard for the retina imaging. And it was replaced by the combination of Fourier domain OCD and a point scanning combination. And still it is the most major OCD used in the clinic. And uh, nearly 100% of the retina OCD is equipped with this combination. And maybe also the cardiovascular OCD, nearly 100% is based on this combination of the point scanning and the free domain. And in contrast, the line field imaging and a full field imaging has a very good property of high speed. Uh, sorry, the combination of FD OCD and the line field, full field has a good property of high speed. So it was used for the quick and the repeating volumetric imaging of the in vivo samples. In comparison to, to, to them, uh, still the combination of time domain OCD and the full field imaging attracts uh, the interest of researchers because it can have a very high lateral resolution 
And uh, I'm going to uh, come back to this point later, but uh, this combination has a very good property of less speckle. So uh, before going to the next step, uh, let me explain the very, very basic of OCD, uh, mainly for the new guys who are going to join to my group, uh, group uh, maybe in the next month or the month after the next month. Okay, the time domain OCD is essentially a low coherence interferometer. Here, the light is coming from the light source and split by a beam splitter, and then uh, reflected back uh, by two mirrors and overlapped again. If the timing of the light is exactly the same for two arms of the interferometer, they started to interfere each other, means um, it can uh, strengthen to each other or it can be distractively interfered to each other. But once you change the path length of one of the arm of the OCD, we don't have any interference because of uh, different timing of the arrival to the detector. Right? And then by replacing one of the mirror into the sample to be measured, and then scan this arm, we are going to have a depth resolved scattering profile of the sample. This is a basic principle of time domain OCD. And then by applying a one dimensional lateral scan, we are going to have a two dimensional cross section. In comparison, the free domain OCD has a slightly different interference property or interference principle. The light itself is a broadband light source at the time domain OCD and it forms the local human interferometer. But the detection part is totally different from the time domain OCD. We are going to use a high speed spectrometer. The light is coming from the light source and split into two arms of the interferometer. And uh, the, in a probe arm, it illuminates the sample and the reflected bag and are corrected to the optical fiber. In the reference arm, uh, we have a reflection by the reference mirror, and this reference beam and a probe beam are recoupled by the coupler and introduced into the high-speed spectrometer. And we are going to have a, a interference signal, but in a spectral domain. And this spectral domain uh, interference signal is digitally signal process and uh, gives us a one-dimensional uh, depth one dimensional profile of the scattering of the sample. Here the point is, uh, here we have a one dimensional depth resolved profile of the sample, but we didn't uh, utilize the mechanical scanning of the reference arm. So it's a one shot measurement, but uh, we can have a one dimensionally depth resolved signal. By applying a one dimensional or two dimensional lateral scan here, uh, we can uh, obtain a two dimensional or three dimensional tomography, sorry, three dimensional tomography of the sample. So what we can do uh, this magical thing, uh, to explain it, I would like to start from the output from the local human interferometer. Here is a schematic of the output light from the local human interferometer. Here to simplify the explanation, we assume a pulse light source as an example of the broadband light source. But this is uh, just for the uh, easy explanation, easy intuitive explanation of the principle. But uh, as you can find in this explanation, I didn't use any nonlinearity or nonlinear response of the sample material. So you can apply the same discussion exactly to non past light source. But in any way, uh, uh, let me use the past light source for the easy explanation. Okay, again, here is the output of the interferometer, and here you have the pulse from the reference arm. And then after some delay, you are going to have a time profile of the probe beam. Um, because of the time of flight manner, um, this probe, the shape of this, temp uh, the temporal profile of this probe beam is exactly what we want to measure, namely the scattering depth resolved scattering profile of the sample. But uh, this one is something what we want to measure, but we cannot measure it directly because it varies too fast. So we need some trick. The first trick is uh, applying the free transform to this entire signal physically by using, the in, uh, by using a spectrometer. And then we might have the spectrum, but actually we cannot measure spe spectrum because we are going to use a CCD camera or something that is intensity sensitive device. So what we are going to measure is actually the power spectrum. Hold on. 
somebody is coming. Okay. Okay. Uh, here is a uh, here is not the spectrum but a power spectrum, and then we digitize it and inversely Fourier transform it in the computer. So then uh, maybe your interest is a relationship with this signal and this output signal. By carefully watching this loop, a uh, loop, you can find it. This is a loop of the Wiener hinge theory. So this means the final output signal is the old collation of this signal, right? And this guy at the center is the old collation of the reference arm itself and the old collation and the probe beam itself. In addition, we have another signal here. It's actually the cross collation between the reference arm and the probe arm appeared in the old collation of this entire signal. And also we have a mirrored complex conjugate here. So in any way, this one, the cross collation, is the sample profile that was blurred by the reference beam. So here, now, it is a point spread function, but uh, uh, we have the shape of the sample. This is exactly what we wanted to measure, namely, it's an OCT signal. Got it? The, the trick, uh, what we can obtain, uh, uh, depth resolved OCT signal with a single shot. Okay. In any way, uh, after learning this principle, I would like to summarize the resolution properties of the OCT. So as I've explained, the resolution properties of the OCT and the, uh, sorry, the axial and the lateral resolution properties of the OCT are independent. For the axial resolution, uh, we have a very established and a famous equation as shown here. So here the point is, uh, here n is a refractive index, but the point is here, uh, we have delta lambda it is the bandwidth of the light source. And the lambda c squared is a square of the center wavelength of the OCD. Got it? So there are two factors we can optimize. Please keep it in mind. And uh, for the latter resolution, we have another equation. Uh, for example, for the scanning system, it is nearly the same with the reflective confocal. Uh, here the point is uh, f over d. d is a beam width. Uh, entering to the objective and f is a focal length of the objective so this means which is the half of the effective numerical aperture of the illumination optics so the uh, lateral resolution of the scanning OCT is in proportional to the inverse of the effective numerical aperture and we have some constant here and this constant includes also the center wavelength for the uh, flat illumination, I mean the imaging type, non-scanning type of OCD, we have another equation. But in any way, it is again, we have a numerical aperture. This is actually uh, not the effective numerical aperture, but it's a numerical aperture of the objective lens And here in this equation. So the resolution becomes better by using a higher numerical aperture. It is again uh, somehow similar to a standard uh, microscopy. So uh, let me explain uh, some examples of the resolution, the, say, typical resolution of a typical configuration of OCD. For the scanning, for example, uh, let me assume the center wavelength is 840 nanometer. This is the most standard wavelength utilized for that uh, retina imaging. And the center, uh, sorry, the bandwidth is 50 nanometer and the refractive index of the sample is 1.38. It is uh, one of the popular refractive index to assume, uh, which is assumed for the, the in vivo tissue. So in this case, uh, the axial resolution is 4.5 microns in tissue. For the lateral resolution, if you assume that the focal length of the objective is 30 millimeters and the input beam diameter is 2 millimeters, and uh, assume the point scan, the lateral resolution becomes 16.0 microns in tissue. So please know that the lateral resolution here is 16 microns. In comparison to standard microscope, it is actually uh, very low. But in, anyway, uh, that's the reason why OCT is not called as a microscopy, but a tomography. And when you think about a flat illumination with the objective lens with a numerical aperture of 0.06, the uh, lateral resolution becomes 8.54 microns. It is a good 
but are still a little bit low, uh, lower than uh, standard microscopes. So the theory of OCT resolutions <coughs> are easy, but there are some open issues. At first, in this theory, we assume X, uh, I mean the lateral and the Z axial resolutions are independent to each other. Or uh, more exactly speaking, uh, we assume the point spread function along X and Z are independent to each other. And a second, spec is not considered in this resolution theory. In reality, the OCD is associated with the spec and it disturbs the visibility of the structure of the sample. So the real recognizable structure is surely larger than the resolution itself, physical, uh, physically limited resolution. And also, uh, we didn't talk about the, the limited depth of focus. So normally, we claim that the OCD has a very good image penetration, such as uh, one, two millimeters. But in reality, the depth of focus of OCD is not as long as millimeters. So there is uh, some, say, approximation, but we just ignore it. Okay, there are three open issues in the current OCD imaging theory. Okay, uh, through this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the one, these open issues one by one. The first point is uh, axial lateral interaction. Now, so far, there was not that much big problem with the uh, axial lateral interaction. But uh, when you are going to go to a high NA numerical aperture to achieve high lateral resolution, this axial lateral interaction becomes severe. For example, based on a study of Martin Villiger, 10, uh, 9, uh, so 2010, uh, we can see that there is a significant interaction, a skewing of the point spread function. Um, it's an interaction between the axial and the lateral. Got it? So uh, the point here is uh, if the numerical aperture becomes high for the high lateral resolution, we cannot ignore the axial lateral interaction. And then the second point is the speculum. OCT is a coherent imaging modality, so it is uh, the speculum is inevitable. And the speculum size in theory uh, is nearly the same with the resolution itself, so it limits the structure visibility. And actually, uh, the real structure we can see in the OCT image is a recognizable structure. The real recognized structure size in the OCT is larger than the OCT resolution. So surely it is our interest to reduce the speck by signal processing, for example. And the most standard and powerful method is averaging. And also there are some sophisticated statistical image processing methods, right? But in any way, actually the averaging is very powerful, simple and powerful. So uh, the, currently the dominant way to remove the, the speck is averaging. In, uh, on the other hand, speck uh, can be even actively utilized for extract more fine information from the OCD. For example, by analyzing that uh, speco, uh, we can have uh, two-dimensional elastography. And the other very, uh, say, famous currently booming modality is OCD angiography. Uh, this analyzes the temporal fluctuation of the speco and uh, extract the region with flow in a sample. So by the way, uh, sorry, uh, so the point here is a practical resolution cannot be described by a standard theory. This is a limitation of a current OCD imaging theory. So by the way, uh, there is an OCD method that is uh, in nature free from speckle, that is incoherent full feed OCD. So in a case of incoherent full feed OCD, uh, the recognizable structure of fineness is nearly the same with uh, with its physical resolution. So that the reason of why actually the incoherent full field time domain OCT was widely used for OCT microscopy. Uh, OCT microscopy is uh, a microscopic version of OCT, literally. Okay, so then uh, what we can do uh, to overcome these issues? The first one is a simply maybe we can increase the physical resolution of OCD imaging. 
For the axial high resolution OCD imaging, we have two ways. Based on that equation, what I've shown, we have uh, two parameters, controllable parameters. One is the bandwidth and the other is the center wavelength. Uh, making the bandwidth into double, we can reduce the resolution and improve the resolution into half, right? And uh, this is a very classical and uh, orthodox method. Even in 1999 or 2004, uh, it was demonstrated nearly a resolution, uh, even with in vivo. It's in, in a case of in vivo, it's still 2.5, but uh, it's a kind of very established method. And for this, titanium sapphire laser and a supercontinuum was used. But recently, uh, there was booming of another approach. It is making the center wavelength of OCD short. And as you can see in this, the center wavelength affects, the positively affects the resolution in the order of two. So it is very effective. So for example, um, by using the visible light as a probeam, we can achieve on a sub, one mic, sub one micron resolution, axial resolution for in vivo human eye imaging. So then uh, what we can do for the lateral resolution improvement and also long depth of focus. The improving the lateral resolution itself is quite easy. Maybe you can utilize a high numerical aperture, but the usage of high numerical aperture is associated with uh, low depth of focus. So there is a trade-off. So the real issue here is how you can overcome the trade-off between the lateral resolution and the depth of focus. So there are several numerical methods actually. The one is ISAM, uh, mainly developed by the group of Illinois. And here uh, you can take the OCD image, three-dimensional OCD data, <coughs> three, and then uh, free transform it into the, the frequency space and the remapped into a non defocused frequency space and a free transform it back. And then you can have a very sharp image through the depth. And uh, my group also demonstrated the forward model based method. And this is uh, based on a two dimensional and fast free transform. So first you can take that the OC data and extract the N fast depth and the free transform it. And then you are going to have the electric field distribution at the pupil plane. And then here we are going to add a lens, but numerically. So means apply the phase, which is equivalent to the uh, focus adjustment lens. And then again, free transform it back into the focal plane, namely the sample plane. So by this trick, uh, we can achieve the, the refocusing after the measurement. For example, here uh, in this data is an example uh, made by Oikawa. Here is the original image is totally blurred, but applying the digital refocus, we can have a very fine structure. We can see the very fine structure of the chicken muscle. And the similar method or similar or numerical framework also can be utilized to correct the high order aberrations. And for example, Stephen Addy uh, demonstrated the, uh, they call it as a computational adaptive optics, CAO. And also Kumar, and actually uh, from Vienna, uh, the, the current group of Antonia, uh, demonstrated the three dimensional, the very similar method, but they call it as a digital adaptive optics, DAO. But in any way, uh, both two are based on a quite similar principle, and it works perfectly. And uh, recently, also, uh, there were several demonstrations. It's a kind of booming of the digital refocusing, and also one from the Harvard Medical School. Okay, But uh, this, say, digital refocusing looks great, and we can do anything. It looks like we can do anything uh, after measuring the OCD data, but surely there is a limitation. And, uh, Fukutake, one of my collaborators, uh, recently uh, demonstrated it in a photonics web this year that the say system uh, sorry the aperture system aperture or system function of the OCD in uh, say frequency space 
should be represented into the four-dimensional space. It is an x and the frequencies of x, y, z, and delay of tau. It's a four dimension, right? And the OCT image is a projection of the signal in the four dimensional space into fx, fy, and omega domain. And by applying the Fourier transform, it, we are going to have a standard OCT image. And the digital refocus is uh, forwarding this data into this fz, fx, fy domain, three dimension again. So here it's omega and here it's fz. So the point is fz and f omega is not the same quantity. And the OCT system or the OCT signal is essentially should be distributed in this four dimensional space, right? And then the point is the OCT image spectrum here is an integration along FC. And a true sample structure is the integration of this 4D signal into, um, uh, into omega direction. So it's an integration and an integration. So through this integration, there is an information loss. So in principle, we cannot remap this, we cannot remap this data into this, this plane. This plane to this plane. It's a, there is a surely a information loss. But if the numerical aperture is low, this four-dimensional distribution becomes thin. If it is thin enough, there is no information loss. It, uh, it can be treated as a remapping, not a projection. Got it? It's a little bit complicated. But a current OCD imaging theory cannot treat this four-dimensional representation, so we cannot predict the limitation of the digital refocus. But based on Fukutake's uh, theory, imaging theory, we can see that on the computational refocus cannot work with um, high NA configuration. That is something uh, we need to investigate more. It's still a kind of open issue. Okay, then uh, let me talk, and uh, finally, let me talk about multifunction imaging. So OCT was uh, from the beginning uh, believed to be an intensity imaging modality, but there was some argumentation. Uh, for example, around 1997, there was a booming of polarization sense for OCD. And also temporal fluctuation of the sample can be analyzed by using OCT, uh, for example, OCT angiography and a dynamic imaging. And uh, for example, polarization sense for OCD, we can measure the phase retardation and uh, biofringence, I mean, the local, uh, uh, sorry, uh, let me clarify this point. Okay, in the early days, the phase retardation imaging was quite interesting, right? Um, but these days, uh, there was a second booming of the polarization sensitive OCD, and there we are measuring the local property of the sample, like a local phase retardation, namely the biofringence, and uh, also local axis uh, orientation properties. But uh, the, in the current OCD imaging theory, this polarization effect was not accounted. So we need to combine the polarization imaging theory and OCD imaging theory. It's another open issue. The OCD angiography is a method to analyze the fluctuation, temporal fluctuation of the OCD signal. And by using it, we can uh, visualize the structure, sorry, the flow structure in a sample. Um, typically, it's a blood vessel. So by uh, without using any contrast agent, we can take our OCD angiography. So it is a kind of reason of the booming of OCD these days. By modifying this method, we can see a more fine structure, more fine activity, uh, say finer activity of the sample, like a metabolism uh, or some necrosis. So there are several demonstrations and I, you can see that uh, most of the demonstrations are quite recent. So it's a, a really a kind of new booming of the method, right? It's a dynamic imaging. And uh, in some word, it can be treated as a time imaging. But we don't have an imaging theory to uh, express the time imaging property. For example, how fast uh, dynamics we can measure, we have no um, theory to predict it. So we need to modify the OCD imaging theory. Okay, so finally, uh, let me conclude my talk. 
As a conclusion, finally, I'm going to talk about the background of this talk. So it's a little bit tricky uh, structure of this presentation. I've started from a matter of facts, and finally, I'm coming to the uh, real background of why I started to think about this. So my question is why we sh uh, okay, my point is we need to revive the OCD imaging theory, and why? And actually, uh, there was a booming of uh, drug discovery of region and uh, regenerative medicine. And for these applications, uh, they are interested in uh, a thick tissue culture, like a spheroid and organoids. And also, um, effect for the effective animal study, we need a good microscopic modality, uh, which can measure the ex vivo tissues. And for these ex vivo tissues, uh, there are several requirements for the modality. The one is it should be label-free, uh, but without any contrast agent, it, it should be capable of visualizing the tissue dynamics. And also, it should be capable of uh, measuring or imaging the deep tissue. And a standard uh, microscopy has only the penetration of a few hundred microns, and it is not sufficient. So we need other modality. And also, we want to achieve the uh, high axial and the lateral resolution, even at the deep region. So for this, uh, also we need to use OCD. But again, standard OCD is not sufficient. We need OCD microscopy, but uh, even standard OCD microscopy is not sufficient to fulfill all of these requirements. So what we can do? For the level-free imaging, we can use uh, dynamics imaging. For deep tissue imaging, we can use a holographic refocusing or adaptive optics. And for the axial and the lateral high resolution imaging, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, there is no one one to one correspondence. So uh, for to fulfill all of these points, we need uh, several techniques. Like uh, we need to use a high NA and a holographic refocus, and uh, we can observe the uh, axial lateral interaction. We need to think about it, and also uh, we need to think about multiple scattering in a deep region. This is resulting in a speckle. So that the reason why we need to think of revising the OCD imaging theory. And this is, I think, now the hot topic of OCD, but still it's a hidden hot topic and only a few people are interested in. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you for attention. And uh, maybe the presentation is uh, open for discussion. Please come up. Uh, I have uh, one point that I don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. uh, as you uh, introduced the uh, Kutake Sensis uh, theory, like uh, the OCT imaging uh, can be described as uh, integration along F, Z, or omega direct uh, okay. axis. I mean, so uh, when you mentioned about this, you said that uh, uh, during the integration, uh, the, the true OCT signal becomes uh, thick, so there might be some signal loss losses. Okay, uh, let me go back to this slide, maybe. Hold on. So, uh, can you see this diagram on the screen? So, what you're no. talking about, uh, this one? Uh, sorry, share the screen again. What you're talking about is the, this diagram, right? Yes. Uh, so here uh, is a four-dimensional frequency space. Yes. Right? And this axis is a two-dimension of X, Fx and Fy. So uh, for the, the visualization purpose, I used uh, one shrink axis. Mm. But uh, this one is not one dimension, but for two dimension. And yes. this axis is a frequency along Z, depth, spatial frequency. Mm. Right? And uh, this axis is omega. It's a wavelength. It's a tricky point. So in a standard OCT theory, uh, Fz and omega are treated at the same. Right? Uh, wait, uh, uh, yes. Uh, in, uh, for example, by uh, free transform along omega, we are going to have uh, depth, depth yes. result image, we believed. But in reality, it's not the depth, but delay. Delay, yes. Delay and the depth are not the same. And uh, this uh. axis, is actually the depth. So these it's two are not the same. Like a similar, like a, uh, say, a Fourier transformation of Z and Fz and Xy to F, Fx, Fy. Yes. That kind of, yeah. 
And uh, what we really interested in is uh, this FZ, FX, and FY, right? Yeah. And this one is a real structure of the image, three-dimensional image space, uh, yes. three-dimensional sample space. Yes. And a free, uh, actually, it's a Fourier transform, but a three-dimensional sample Fourier structure space. But here, this one is the image space. It's, it's Fx, Fy, and omega. By free transforming it, we are going to have a x, y, tau. It's a delay, not z. This, uh, this one is a standard OCD, right? Yes. And then what is the relationship between this true sample structure and this OCD image structure? Okay, this is the one point, one, the first question. So how we can think about it? So here, uh, you can see some, the uh, red region here, right? And this red region is a system aperture. So all of the signals we are going to measure by the OCD should distribute within this aperture. Yes. Yeah. But this is uh, this is the signal which can contribute to the OCD images. But this doesn't necessarily mean we can resolve all of this information. So here the system aperture, but what we can measure is only the integration of this sig uh, distributed signal within this aperture. Uh, sorry, uh, let me restate. So all of the OCD signal should be distributed in this four dimensional aperture, right? But yeah. what we are going to measure is only the integration of this distributed signal along FZ. Got it? Yeah. So it's an integration means the information of the distribution along FZ is disappeared. It's integrated out. Mm -hmm. Got it? So essentially, OCD captures the information in this four dimensional aperture. But what we can finally measure is only the integration along FZ. So the FZ and the uh, signal distribution information along FZ is disappeared already. But yeah. here, this is something we can measure, right? Yeah. And then the uh, our problem is how we can retrieve the information of the real sample structure. It's here, right? Right in the image and in a, in this diagram. Yes. Yes. Retrieve this information from this information we've measured. Got it? Mm. So then, uh, then now you can assume uh, if we are using a low numerical aperture objective, this four dimensional distribution, I mean the aperture becomes very thin, right? Like a, a, you can think about it, it's a, just a very thin arc here. So in this case, integration makes nothing. So what you need to do is uh, just remapping. So for example, starting from this and going to this and hitting uh, here in the shell and uh, say remap into here. So there is, uh, in this case, we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between these two planes. So I see. Case, if we can uh, clearly say describe, theoretically describe the shape of this, uh, thin shell, we can transfer this data into this domain. And after doing it, we can free transform it. And then we are going to have a, a very sharp image along the depth. That is actually nearly the same with ISAM. Got it? Yeah. And uh, our uh, forward uh, model-based method also based on the uh, same assumption that NA is uh, is low, and this four-dimensional aperture is thin. So in this case, actually, we can uh, do the same operation by applying the phase. Yes. So uh, that the reason of uh, actually under applying the phase and the remapping it uh, based on I okay the, in a say forward model, we are applying the phase, and for the ISAM we are doing a remapping but both of them are based on the same model and the same assumption. Uh, it, the model is not uh, not exactly the same, but the same assumption. So the limitation is the same. 
And in my understanding, that is the reason why what Kumar found in 2014 in uh, optics experts, biomedical optics experts, the comparison. And ISAM and a forward model based method has a similar refocusing performance. So on the surface, ISAM looks like more exact than a forward model. But in reality, both of them relies on the same assumption. So the limitation of these two methods are nearly the same. This is my understanding for this. OK. OK, thank you. OK, so do you guys have uh, any other question? Feedback, please. Hello? Yep. Uh, this is Sanjay. Awesome. I think it's a great talk. Thank I you. I just want to comment that um, in the first, probably in the second slide, mm -hmm. the comments that, um, um, sorry, probably in the, uh, let me check. Can you scroll down? One more, two more. Uh, about uh, um, the classification of the OCT system depends on where it's, uh, yeah, yeah that's this one. I think I want to comment. Um, yeah, sorry, previous slides. This one, yes. Uh, for live field imaging, actually, it shouldn't be NA. Uh, this one, right? Yeah, yes, there's yes. a recent paper published from the French group. Yeah, um, actually, uh, Makita also pointed out, and I yes. corrected. Yeah, I think right. uh, uh, from uh, previous training in Bokara's group, mm -hmm. as well as there's a company, uh, Demi. They have the line field time domain OC system with a super continuum light source. Thank you, time domain. Yeah, I think that's the only one thing I can um, mm -hmm. augment right now. Yeah, Great. but Thank overall, you. it's a very nice uh, talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, um, any other comment, um, especially from students? So, any uh, stupid question are okay for this OCD seminar? Please come up. Mm. Uh, yes, Yeah, come on. Uh, can you please explain, like in uh, one slide, you explain the open issue of the polarization sensitive OCT. So okay. can you please explain in details little? Okay, it's a good point. Uh, actually, uh, that was not in my original presentation, but I added for this, uh, this domestic talk, internal talk, and say, uh, from this slide and my presentation on um, the open issue for the polarization sensitive imaging is not clear. But in my understanding, actually, uh, we can, what I'm interested in right now is a combination of numerical pupil engineering and the polarization sensitive OCT, right? And uh, for example, uh, what's going to be happen if we apply the, uh, say, helical phase in a pupil. Got it? So, uh, for example, uh, you can think of a kind of uh, tangentially changing phase at the pupil plane. Now, starting from zero and uh, increasing the phase, and uh, after one round, it becomes two pi. Got it? So, in this case, we are going to have uh, a spiral shape of the spot. Hmm? The spiral polarization, sorry, spiral, uh, no, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. The, uh, manipulating the polarization of the pupil. For example, you can think of uh, a radial polarizer at the pupil plane. And then we are going to have uh, some something like a donut shape. And also you can think of uh, the helical, uh, you know, rotating, Phase polarization retarder at the, at the pupil plane. Uh, still, I'm a little bit confused about this. But in, anyway, uh, in this case, we can have uh, something like a helical structure of the point spread function. And I'm interested in uh, what the image property of this. But at this moment, we don't have uh, a, a good imaging theory to treat this kind of issues. Got the point? Yeah, okay. 
So the point is the combination of a pupil engineering and a polarization imaging. A pupil engineering, the polarization pupil engineering. And we have no theory to uh, clearly describe what's going to be happening with this. OK, <clears throat> okay thank you. OK, um, any other issues? A question, a comments? Uh, I have a, a, a brainstorming idea. <laughs> uh, can you go back to the uh, that four dimensional issue in the slide? Yeah. Uh, this one, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you believe we can maybe use like GA model to to overcome this kind of modeling issue? Uh, you mean a G? Uh, you said a GA? GAN, uh, Generative Adversarial Network. <laughs> Because recently I read a paper, uh, a, a CVPR of this, a CVPR paper of this year, and uh, I think the performance is really, really good. So I'm wondering if we know the true sample structure, maybe we can use the uh, major signal to and the train the network to to reconstruct the true sample. Actually, I'm half positive and half negative for this idea. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me explain uh, my way of thinking of the neural network things, right? Mm -hmm. And the neural network image reconstruction can be classified into two types. The one type is uh, the one using the sample structure knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the demonstration, the recent demonstration of a combination of neural network and OCD are in this category. And uh, in my group, for example, uh, what Dong Wu is trying to do is uh, this one, using the sample features and uh, using it as a knowledge and to regenerate the image based on that knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And the other category i especially interested in is uh, uh, analyzing the information which is essentially carried in the OCD image and extracted. Mm. So the information already, in this case, the information already carried in the OCD image, but we have no way to extract it. Mm -hmm. And the example of it is a Prowse method of the spec analysis, for example. Uh, uh, the scatter density information should be possessed in the OCD image, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, we have no way to extract it. The fourth problem is simple. There is a scatterer, uh, there is a interference, the mutual interference by the scatterers, the light from the scatterers, each scatterers. And then we have a speckle. So it's a deterministic process. But uh, extract the scatterer information itself, we have no way. Mm -hmm. so this is that the information should be possessed by the OCT already. But uh, we don't have a way to extract it. So we are going to train the new random work to extract that information. So that is uh, something in a way I'm particularly interested in. And uh, what Oikawa is doing is something similar. So what Oikawa is doing is uh, generating the dopu image from an OCD image, right? Mm. But in this case, what I'm uh, particularly interested in is not the RP segmentation, but uh, the new random uh, train the new random work to analyze the speckle pattern to extract the information associated with the multiple scattering and uh, knowledge and uh, maybe also the VNS knowledge that the dopu is associated with the multiple scattering. So in this case, maybe we have uh, some say speckle property or the scattering property in the OCD image, not polarization sensible OCD image, but a standard OCD image. Hmm. And, uh, and the information exists there that we have no way to extract it. Mm -hmm. Right. The only one way right now is uh, using the polarization sensitive OCD. But uh, maybe we can extract the same information from a standard OCD. But we don't know how we can do it. 
So in this case, we can train the neural network to find the method to extract this kind of information, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, from this pass, okay, so there are two methods. Uh, one is uh, uh, extracting the information uh, which already possessed in the signal, but we have no way to extract it. And the second way is that uh, generating the information which is not possessing the sample. In this yes. case, the neural network relies on the knowledge, right? It's, it's not a, a real analysis, but uh, making the image based on the knowledge of other samples. Hmm. Now, what I'm particularly interested in the first class, got it? So the point is here, uh, when we think about it, uh, if, uh, uh, okay, there is, in, in this diagram, there is a significant information loss because of the integration already. Yes. So the uh, second class cannot be implemented because information has already been lost in theory. So the GAN maybe uh, can create a sharp image, uh, but in this case, uh, okay, GAN can make a high resolution image from the blood OCD image, but it's a kind of a deep learning microscope. Hmm. Uh, a deep learning neural network can remember and extract the knowledge of a high resolution image and then use it to reconstruct the high resolution image from the unknown image, unknown blood image. Mm -hmm. So in this case, uh, the approach is exactly the same with a deep learning, a deep learning microscope. But uh, based on this theory, what we can do is this is not the real measurement, but it's a kind of image generation. And again, it's surely the image generation, but anyway. yes. So maybe uh, somebody can do it. Uh, maybe it is out, a little bit out of my interest. Mm -hmm. So what I I'm see. Interested in <laughs> extracting the information, which is already possessed in the OCD image, but uh, we have no way to extract it. Mm. Okay, and, and, and anyway, uh, thank you for your feedback. Uh, thank you. Okay, um, any other uh, comments, question? Okay, um, if, can I, yeah, can I on. ask one, uh, like maybe a uh, very silly question, like I want to ask like in one slide you uh, show like the averaging to remove the speckle and uh, and some uh, uh, applications like OCT uh, and geography and elastography, you use the speckle information. So uh, for which applications uh, like this kind of two applications, we use the speckle information, but some applications we remove the speckle information. So, mm -hmm. in uh, like, how do we know previously that that the speckle information we need for these applications or no? Sorry, for, uh, I didn't catch your point. Like uh, some like for some applications, we reduce the space uh, speckle by averaging or like some image processing method. Mm -hmm. And for some applications, we use the speckle information to uh, see the um, information about the sample. So, uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't know previously about the sample in uh, sample uh, information in previous, so uh, how do we know? Like, if we need to average, uh, if we need to reduce the speckle, or we need the speckle information. Uh, no, no, it's uh, not an issue of need to do or something. So simply, we can do both. The speckle, and uh, the point is that uh, there is a multiple images, right? So if you have two images, you can compute the mean and the standard deviation, right? Now, each order of uh, momentum carries a different types of information. So if you compute the uh, first order momentum, of multiple images, namely the average, it gives you a static property of the sample. Uh, yes, it's yes. A, a mm. Averaging speckle reduction, right? Mm. And if you compute a standard deviation, you can have an OCT angiography. And if you apply a little bit more sophisticated analysis of uh, speckle property, you can have an elastography. Mm. So, uh, uh, yeah. My understanding is a difference of the order of information. 
And uh, the point is how we can use it. The, the each, say, momentum order of the information, the time sequence or the sequential images. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, have any other question, comments, or uh, something you want to discuss? Uh, I have a small okay. question. Yep. For, uh, for OCT and geography processing, mm -hmm. uh, how, many, how many images were uh, generally used for OCT and geography uh, processing? I think typically it's four, three to oh. four. So it's not that much. So if we, we increase the uh, uh, number of images, uh, the image quality become better. Uh, it's a good point. Um, so by increasing the number of images, the estimation accuracy of the standard deviation becomes better. So from this perspective, it becomes better, right? But uh, no, no, uh, yes. Uh, but if you have multiple images, actually, you also can think of the other way. Uh, for example, computing. Uh, okay, uh, you can. Uh, for example, you can think of uh, there are uh, four images, uh, no, four frames, right? Mm -hmm. And you can compute uh, two OCT angiography images, and then mm -hmm. you can average it. Oh. Right. So actually, uh, there are several combinations, and uh, there is uh, some say different imaging property. Mm -hmm. Uh, based on uh, which kind of analysis you are doing. And mm -hmm. actually, Makita did uh, analysis once and published it. Uh, when was it, Makita? Is he here, actually? Okay, it seems Makita is not here today. Okay, uh, but in, anyway, uh, actually, you can check the paper from Makita. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Optics Express. Okay. And uh, also, uh, the OCTA and the uh, dynamics imaging are closely related. And uh, mm. for this, you can check the recent publication of Ibrahim, the discussion part. Uh. So actually, uh, there are two issues, uh, no, two parameters you need to think of, the number of frames and uh, uh, time window. Mm. Okay. Okay. And also, actually, this is uh, associated with uh, what Ting Hao is doing with Shanchie. But it, it's not published yet. I think uh, he is now working for the revision of the paper. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, there are multiple factors which can uh, which can affect to the image quality of OCTA. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, any other question, comments? Okay, so uh, it's already uh, over one hour of this time. So uh, let me close uh, today's talk. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, thank you. 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 Uh, did, we, did we define who is the next? Uh, it's me. Ah, okay. So then uh, it is going to be the next week, right? Yes. It's the seventh. And you yes. are the final person uh, we defined. So after Kiriko, who is the presenter? We didn't define it yet, right? Maybe, yes. Okay, so if we can do it. So uh, almost all of you here has already been done, right? Maybe we need to think of a second round. Okay, uh, I will think about it and uh, send you the message personally, maybe, first. And then uh, we'll make an announcement later. Got it? OK, uh, so uh, uh, by the way, um, is can you hear? Kaishi is here, right? Maybe Tenyu uh, Ten is here today. OK, uh, can you give a short presentation? Maybe 14th of December. Yeah, I can try. Okay. Then uh, after after Kiriko, maybe Ten Yui can give us a short review. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you next week, guys. And see uh, maybe, you. maybe Shanti, see you soon in a conference.
online. But see you. Yeah. See you. Okay. So see you guys. See you. 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 See you.